aware of Chow, but uh, never come to kind of one of these little uh, powwows that we throw. But uh, I, I really appreciate the uh, opportunity to come and speak. Uh, my name is Dusty O'Connell, obviously. Um, I have a background probably 15 years-ish in hospitality. Uh, right now, I'm a consultant with TT Consulting, which basically means that um, I do menu development or kind of opening assistance for uh, you know new owners, people that people that for whatever crazy reason want to get into the restaurant industry but don't know how to do it. Uh, you know, I'm there to kind of you know smooth those uh, rough spots that you know come along with opening a new spot. And, you know, part of that involves, you know, it's a holiday season. Part of that is, you know, I get to do, uh, I get to bartend um, like holiday parties, things like that. You know, my, my background has over the last probably five, six years become mostly uh, management and bartending and uh, with a particular focus on opening new spots. But uh, yeah, uh, consultant with TT Consulting. Uh, right now I write the beverage menu for Joy Hill a uh, pizza place on South Broadway. Um, before that, I was the general manager of uh, the Cachino Taco location on Broadway. And then before that, I was general manager at uh, Izakaya Ronin in Rhino, which uh, no longer exists, which is becoming more and more common in our industry these days. Um, I'm here today because of a meme on Facebook. Uh, it sounds terrible, right? Um, I saw this meme in the in a group of you know I'm, I'm part of you know different industry groups and I saw somebody post this meme, and I'm going to share my screen with you right now so you can see it. Oh, I can't. Um, so the meme is uh, you know it's like the two cute Shiba Inus, and one of them is like big and buff, and he's wearing like a chef coat and a big toque, and there's like the little tiny sad one. And, uh, and the big buff one is line cooks in 2005. I work 65 plus hours a week, only doubles. The chef only threw three plates at me this week. And then, you know, the little kid sad one is, you know, line cooks in 2020. These 30 hours are too much. You don't appreciate my feelings. And that meme just really resonated with me because I think it goes right to the heart of one of the biggest kind of culture problems in the industry and like a fool, I waded into a Facebook argument about it, but I thought it was important because I think, you know, these, uh, these issues are part of why, uh, you know, groups like this kind of exist. And I think it's important to, whenever you see uh, these kind of attitudes to fight back against them. Uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit more. Um, kind of my personal background, you know, I grew up in North Dakota um, worked in restaurants throughout college. My first restaurant job was at a Perkins family restaurant way back in 2003. And it was, I mean, talk about a perfect introduction to the industry. That place is, uh, an institution in Grand Forks, North Dakota. It, uh, it is beloved by locals. It's right across the street from the hospital. So you get a lot of opportunities to, um, be kind of an oasis for people who have, you know, family that are sick or for patients themselves, you know, they'll come across the street and come to Perkins and have a nice cup of coffee and some pancakes and, you know, get away from uh, the hospital because, you know, it's, it's lame. And Perkins Family Restaurant, they take that very seriously. You know, some of the waitresses have worked there since literally the 1970s. You know, some of the people that I worked with back in the early 2000s are still there and have kids of their own now. And kind of seeing that made me be like, wow, well, this is, this is pretty cool. This is a really great job. And I kind of moved on from that after a while to um, working in a more corporate atmosphere at uh, the Green Mill, um, kind of another upper Midwestern chain, you know, bar food, pizza, that kind of thing. That was kind of where I got my feet wet bartending. And then I was like, holy crap, I can make a lot of money without really knowing how to do anything. Uh, so I did that until um, I finished school and then uh, I moved to Colorado because I love it here. And I was kind of out of the industry for a while. I tried a couple of different things that were 
more associated kind of with what I went to school for, but none of them really took, you know, I missed the pace of service. I missed the connection with guests. I missed the connection with staff. Uh, I, I, I just missed so many of the kind of cultural things about it. And so I kind of bumped around a little bit, kind of decided to make my specialty, you know, Japanese food and booze and worked in a, a few places in Boulder and Denver to kind of try to build that up and um, just sort of learned a lot of stuff along the way about how owners operate, about kind of kitchen culture, about bar culture, about um, hospitality, just like how to really give guests a great experience, how to share my passion for awesome food and kind of rare uh, drinks with people. You know, I always, I always looked at my job as a teaching opportunity because a lot of times people will come into, you know, a sushi place and they're like, oh, I really want to try some Japanese whiskey, but I don't know anything about it. I really want to eat some cool sushi or, you know, some cool Japanese food, but I don't really know anything about it. And so it was an opportunity for me to really push the passion that I had for teaching into kind of a different context, like a, like less of a, you know, classroom context and more of a, you know, these people are here to have a good time. Let's make sure they have the best time possible. Um, of course, I failed upward into management. And, uh, you know, once you have general manager skills, then kind of your, your career is in demand. And um, I had, I, I discovered that I kind of had a particular joy and talent for opening new restaurants, which, boy, talk about a double-edged sword. Um, new places are just a million things that you don't think are going to go wrong, go wrong. Things you can't even imagine are going to come out of left field and, you know, screw up your day. But, you know, I was pretty good at it. So when um, the owner of the first Cachino Taco down in Englewood approached me, he was like, you know, we're opening a new location on Broadway and, uh, you know, we think you'd be a great GM. You come kind of personally recommended. And I was like, great. And this was kind of, Well, I'll just get right into it. Uh, we were rehabilitating, basically we were rehabilitating a, a, an old restaurant and opening it. And we just ran into uh, issue after issue that, I mean, we opened probably two and a half months after we had projected to open. Um, it made it really hard to hire. We had a lot of kind of technical problems with the building. We had a, a lot of snafus with the city and licensing. And it was probably the most professionally stressful time of my life. And at the same time, I was also going through a lot of uh, personal stress. And, you know, it became overwhelming. I think by the time that we had been open for a week, I had been working uh, seven days a week, 60 to 70 hours a week for over a month already. And, you know, there was just no real sign of that letting up. And, you know, I'd always kind of prided myself on being able to run a bar without falling into a lot of the traps that come along with running a bar. But, you know, I was just out of gas and, and the mask slipped. And there was one day, you know, it was kind of a slow Saturday, but, you know, I had, uh, I had turned to some unhealthy coping mechanisms and it was the you know, middle of the afternoon. And I just happened to be in the restaurant doing some admin stuff. And somebody who, uh, is fairly prominent in the industry here in Denver, came in just as a guest. And, you know, he kind of pulled me aside. He was like, dude, you look really rough. Like, I don't think you should necessarily be at work right now. You should probably like go home. You look like you've, you look like you, not only have you had too much to drink last night, but like maybe too much to drink today. And that was a really like tough kind of eye-opening situation, especially when it's somebody that you kind of view as like a, like a mentor or, you know, somebody that's already taught you a lot to have them pull you aside and tune you up like that. It's just like, ah, geez, what is going on with me? So I, you know, kind of took a step back, um, both from just alcohol in general and from restaurants. I did, I, we agreed that I didn't really want to be the general manager anymore because uh, there was just no work-life balance. And that's part of why the meme that I was telling about um, kind of got me so hard because that's like a whole thing, right? 
uh, in 2005, this was before all of the kind of media and books and TV shows um, talking about being a chef or working in a restaurant as like an honorable career, you know, 2005, basically everybody's, uh, if you had a hero or like a book that you would read that kind of pulled the curtain back on working in a kitchen or working in a restaurant, it was Kitchen Confidential by Anthony Bourdain. You know, there were a lot of people who swore by that as their Bible. And, you know, it, it painted kind of a, a, a scary picture of what it's like to work in a restaurant. And, you know, this was even 20 years before that, you know, Bourdain fondly remembers, oh, you know, I, I burned myself. Is there a Band-Aid? And his sous chef is like, ah, oh, this guy wants a Band-Aid. What a baby. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that attitude kind of permeated kitchens for a long time. I like to, I like to call people like that uh, uh, pirate MFers. You know, there's this, this attitude that, you know, kitchens were just like a, a crew of pirates that, you know, worked 65 hours a week and drove themselves into the ground and, you know, they would smoke a million cigarettes and leave work and get hammered at the end of the day or, you know, at three o'clock in the morning and then, you know, come back and do it all again. And I saw this meme on Facebook just, you know, a week or so ago. And I thought, you know, that's a very kind of outdated way to run a restaurant. And my reply was basically to the effect, like looking at it purely from the perspective of a manager, from the perspective of a business owner, from somebody who wants to, you know, make money running a restaurant, I would rather have 35 hours or 40 hours of your best work than 35 hours of good work and then 35 hours of garbage work where I have to throw plates at you because you're tired or you're hungover or, you know, you're not focused. I mean, when you think about the, cause there's always that guy in every kitchen, right. That wants to work, you know, every single shift, you know, only works doubles, blah, 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 blah. Uh, are those guys the best and most consistent, you know, do they do the best work? Are those people writing menus? Are those people, uh, putting out consistent and precise plates. I mean, sometimes it's possible, but it doesn't always happen. And I find that it doesn't happen more often than not. And I think that part of the solution to that is just being willing to recognize when people are still kind of promulgating this outdated belief and uh, putting a stop to it. I mean, there's a lot of um, technical things you can do as far as running the company to make sure that that culture doesn't, you know, it starts at the top, right? Uh, if you have an HR person that isn't going to say, Hey, come sit on my lap and, you know, tell me what's going on. Uh, if you have, uh, written policies and these all sound you know, for fairly basic things for any medium to large company, but you know, we've all worked in places where, the owner, you know, there's no employee handbook, you know, there's no chain of command, there's no uh, process for dealing with, you know, hey, I, uh, I don't feel like I know how to do my job. Somebody I work with is toxic. You know, I think somebody showed up to work when they shouldn't have come to work, you know, so there are, there are places that just don't have systems in place to deal with those kind of complaints. And for a long time, the expectation was, well, these are just things that happen you know, suck it up buttercup. And I don't think there's, um, especially going forward with the effect that the pandemic is having on our industry, I don't think there's room for that kind of attitude really anymore. And I've seen the difference, you know, I've worked for owners where they gave me the keys to the shop and, you know, they were like, you hire your staff, train them, do whatever you want. But, you know, certain parts, certain crucial business parts stayed opaque. And, you know, the, the reasoning behind that, you know, okay, that's, that's the way you want to run your business, but, you know, is it the best way? I think <clears throat> generally uh, transparency helps a lot because it makes it easier to deal with uh, culture issues. So, um, we're in a place now as an industry where, you know, a lot of places are closing and they're not going to open back up. And 
I think it represents an opportunity. I think it's a, a chance for us to really kind of model ourselves in the in the way that some successful companies that have generated some really great people are uh, are doing things. And it's hard because you know it took me a long time to find my voice as a leader and be willing to advocate for my employees. You know, when uh, for example, when a very critical member of our staff at one of the places I worked before, you know, he had a death in the family and there wasn't really anybody that could step up and do his job. So I said, you know what? Uh, I'll do it. I'll learn how to cook. You know, it's only for a week. We're not, it's not going to be the busiest week of the year. It's not like we're doing restaurant week, but uh, you know, I'll, I'll spend a few days back there. You know, I can, I can still cook and I will take on, you know, his, uh, workload so that he can go and, you know, be with his family. And he told me later that if he, like, if I hadn't stepped up and kind of helped him share the load, he probably would have quit. And that would have been terrible for the company. Like this guy was the glue that was holding that kitchen together. And all he needed was, you know, a week off and ownership wasn't interested in finding a, a solution. So I, you know, just took it on took it on myself, which is not to say that you should always take every problem onto yourself, but um, what makes a great leader is being willing to go to bat and get things done. You know, I'm not as good of a cook as he was, but being able to step in and do the job acceptably made a huge difference, both in his personal life and all of our professional lives. And staying resilient is uh, always a hard thing. I mean, definitely after, you know, being, being tuned up in the hallway that day at Kachino Taco, I definitely, um, kind of changed my personal relationship with work and with alcohol and with a lot of things, you know, it was a real big wake up call, but the most, uh, the most important thing to me now, whenever I'm in any kind of restaurant context or any kind of, you know, party context, whenever I'm doing anything hospitality wise, um, the team comes first and that can take shape in a lot of ways. Uh, being able to work every station is a bonus, but oftentimes not practical, but, you know, just being able to cover for each other emotionally or mentally, or just like, even just genuinely asking, you know, are you okay? What, uh, what can I do to make your day better? and being able to anticipate what uh, you know, your, your, your folks need, what your team needs and, uh, and delivering it for them so that everybody can stay focused on, on the guest. Cause that's, that's the reason that you know, every place is still open is the, the guests coming through the door. And you know, having worked in places where there's the kind of leader at the top that uh, cracks the whip and has an iron fist and working in places where leadership kind of comes from behind or comes from the bottom where everybody is working together. The guest experience is just night and day different. You know, you want to go back to places where people are happy and having a good time. And that was just kind of what I was trying to represent in the, in the, the conversation that uh, kind of blew up on, on Facebook. You know, there's a, uh, there's no room in what the restaurant industry is going to turn into over the next five years for these pirate MFers and their old French cooking habits and kind of the, the way that they approach the job. You know, there's, there's an opportunity for a flight to quality. You know, the places that survive are going to have to be really good. And in order to be good, everybody has to be firing on all cylinders, no matter who makes every plate. They all got to look the same. They all got to be great. You know, there's not going to be room for 200 restaurants that serve a, a decent bowl of pho. You know, you've got to, whatever you do, you've got to do it great. And you can't have that greatness when you're worn out. And I think kind of the growth of organizations like this, uh, I think the zero proof movement in, uh, in bartending 
you know, I think we're starting to recognize that a lot of the things that we've done in this industry have been really toxic to our staff and have led to kind of a whatever guest experience. I can think of dozens of times where kind of I've been at my just mental limit in terms of too many things going on at once, too many people yelling at me, trying to manage every department. And it's led to, like, I still, you know, at three in the morning when I can't sleep, I still think about this one guest in particular. And it was just, I didn't even mean to make it sound the way I did, but I was just so frazzled. I, I told them that they could, you know, enjoy the, basically I was comping their dinner because we had just screwed up everything. And what I meant to say was, you know, please enjoy your dinner. It's on us. Uh, don't worry about it. But what it came out sounding like was, please just eat your food and leave. <laughs> and I felt so terrible because that wasn't what I was going for. You know, I, I wanted, I felt badly for them and I wanted them to feel like they had been taken care of. But just because I was not able to focus in the moment, it just came out wrong. And I, I just, I wish I could go back to that poor, because the look on the poor woman's face, I still, I will never forget it. I just, I just wish I could go back and be like, I'm so sorry. I, I didn't mean for you to feel that way. And, you know, we're at a point where when the restaurant industry kind of does come back, you know, nobody should ever have to have an experience like that. And that starts with us all being able to take care of ourselves and being able to take care of each other, you know, and not, um, making ourselves seem like heroes or martyrs for working too hard and not taking care of ourselves. Like, why is chef throwing plates at you in the first place? Those plates are expensive. And, you know, there's less and less of that, you know. I think there's a lot of opportunities for people who want to lead from behind. And I think um, leading from behind is really the way forward. You know, you've got to have the, the structures in place to set people up for success. And we have to build each other up as teammates and push each other to do better work, to give ourselves, you know, the time to read books about rare whiskeys or different garnish techniques or, you know, experiment with new tools and new ingredients, you know, be, to be able to do the things that we can then turn around and take back to work and show off, you know? I think the restaurant industry is gonna kind of cleave a little bit. There's gonna be, there's always gonna be a McDonald's and Chipotle, but if you really wanna go out to a restaurant, if you wanna put yourself through all the hassle of dining out, the experience had better be great. You know, you'd better be able to deliver like a laugh and clap my hands type experience. And if you wanna do that, you know, you need to be able to bounce ideas off the people you work with and um, kind of develop your collective voice as a kitchen, as a bar team, as a, as a hospitality posse, like whatever it is, you all, everybody has to work together and, oh no, uh, and steer the, and row the boat the same way. And it just really grinds my gears when I see uh, you know, especially young people, well, young people, when I see any person uh, trying to act like the pirate way is the better way, you know, that people just, you know, complain to people need to just shut up and work harder. Like that's, that's how we got where we are today. And I think a lot of us would agree that where we are today isn't that great, but, you know, we have a, a rare opportunity to change a lot of the things that are undesirable about our workplaces. And there are models for, you know, great success out there. And, you know, I think, just think it's up to us to call out the negativity when we see it and just to be there for each other.